So this is a pretty simple demonstration of pressure and the fact that molecules do exist. If I'm to get two cans like that, and ideally what I should have is a straw, but I don't think I have one at hand, and blow between them, what do you think would happen? It moved apart. Why? Tell me again, why would they move apart? Why would there be a higher pressure in between? There is any amount of pretty cool demonstrations you can do with atmospheric pressure. Right? Or, and this isn't even atmospheric pressure, this is just normal pressure. So I blow between the two of them, and the two of them you said... Wow. It couldn't be sillier, and yet it demonstrates that there's something pretty strange. You blow out the air, and so there's less pressure. Yeah, there's less there's air, so there's less How do I blow out the air? Aren't you blowing? Ah, well, what, what does, how does blowing get rid of it? Yeah, we get back to the piece of paper. You're right, and blowing some of the atoms out of there. So therefore, there's less pressure in there. Yeah. And there's greater so pressure outside. What does it mean to say you blow the particles out of there? How are you displacing them? How are they being you displaced? If you were one of those atoms. I am one of those little air molecules. I'm an O2 molecule sitting right there. Somebody comes along and does that. How do I know? to move that direction. What caused me to force? A push. How was I pushed? By more coming. High pressure going to low pressure. I'm there minding my own business. How would I know that somebody there was blowing with a big massive straw? It hits me. What hits me? More, more of the same. More of the same. So now we're saying, instead of saying you're getting rid of the air in there, what you're replacing it with something else. So you can't say the obvious stuff. What I'm getting at here, one of the things I'm getting at is quite often I as a teacher am to blame. We give you little stock phrases that you use about high pressure and low pressure and you think the answer is tied in there somewhere. But to actually get really down into it, you get rid of all those stock phrases and quite often you have to just think about what's going on in the molecule. Right? So back to it. Yeah, you're right. It would make sense that you're blowing out what's there and therefore there's a vacuum and therefore the two things come together in a vacuum. But blowing something out at this stage means you're heating molecules off of it. So we go again. At this stage, am I too far apart? Definitely not. Not too far apart. I am blowing in that direction, and these two guys come together. Now let's take, come back a little bit. Why do you think they would come together? Higher pressure on the outside and inside. So that bit is correct. So we've got the fact that you're not replacing what's there with other air. Or I suppose you are, but you're not getting rid of the air. So there's not a vacuum there as such. You're like making it circle. So. Okay, the air is moving. That's certainly important. Now, if you were to look at those atoms normally, those atoms, and this is, again, I think this is astounding when I first came across this. Atom sits there. Is it stationary? No. What's it doing? Constantly. Constantly. In what direction? Everywhere. 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 So that's the key bit. There's molecules in there. And they're just jigging around in every single direction. And as the temperature increases, this is an aside, but as the temperature increases, what happens to the motion? They move more, more quickly. Not they move more, they move more quickly, right? So as, as the temperature increases, they'll move more quickly. That will become relevant later on. These guys are moving in all sorts of different directions. So if they're moving and banging against the can in all sorts of different directions, why don't the can go out? Same Equal, and again, they're going all different directions, but there's a certain amount of them going in that direction. And when you're replacing them, they're all going in one direction. So now I come along and I blow in that direction, and yes, I'm replacing the molecules there with other molecules, but instead of going in that direction, they're going in that direction. So it's not, this comes back to our notion of pressure. Like, we just think of pressure as a word, but pressure is actually caused by what? And moving be more precise than moving. If I, like, why the pressure in there, we said, has gone down? Because the, the atoms are just actually forcing the direction. Change it. The pressure has gone down because the molecules are moving in that direction. We've got, we're familiar with the phrase, the pressure has gone down, but what does it mean in terms of the molecular motion? They're moving in that direction instead of the longer. That is, that is correct, but there's more to it than that. If you were that can, how would, would the pressure have gone up or down or no change by me blowing the air through? Yeah. Certainly if I'm at, if you're this side of the can and I blow the air through, does the pressure increase, decrease, or stay the same? Decrease. Yes. I'm the can, what do I notice? Less and Less what? Less air more. Less resistance. 
resistance, okay, less resistance, and that's why you end up moving in that direction, with less air, air molecules or or acting, on it. acting on it and banging off it per second, or less molecules banging off it per second. And that's what pressure is. It's got to do with molecules banging off the surface. So if you've got a barometer, there's different types of barometers you can get. What they measure is the number of molecules banging off the surface, let's say, per second. And the more banging off per second, the what? The higher the pressure. Now, why do you think a needle would move like that if the pressure goes up? What would cause that needle to move? Yeah, it's basically the more particles like that means the whole surface as a result is going to move. And that's how a barometer works. It's all those invisible particles that you can't see. So, uh, Evan, you were giving a simple example there. If I, I take a piece of paper like this, and this is one of the principles under which flight takes place. And I think any time you're sitting in a plane and you see the sides of those bloody things, and you think, how do they get off the ground? I mean, I still think that's amazing. I blow over this. What happens to all the particles that are there? They're bouncing. Okay, they're bouncing in all different directions. I, what's going to happen? Very good. The ones underneath, some of the ones underneath are pointing upwards like that. Some of the ones above it are pointing downwards like that. And therefore, the cage stays down. But if I make these guys go in that direction, there's not enough going down. So just by blowing over there, one, two, three, four, five, six, the whole thing rises up like that. So again, it's a very simple demonstration that these particles do actually exist, right? And that this whole notion of molecular motion and pressure, we do seem to be onto something here, okay? So that's important because we're now moving on to something called Boyle's Law, and we talk about pressure a lot. But all the time we're talking about pressure, if it's a gas we're talking about, in order to make sense of it, you've got to think, hang on, pressure is caused, whatever is measuring the pressure, is caused by something hitting off another surface. Right? So we bear that in mind. Right, we come up to here, James, so if you can focus on the screen, please bring it up there. There we go. As I decrease the volume, and this is what Boyd's Law was all about, he said, as you decrease the volume, so it starts, if I can bring it all the way up, in fact, I just increase it slowly, I expand. So I expand, so what's happening to my volume? What's happening to pressure? Why? Be more precise, I suppose. That's why it's a. You yeah, know? What is pressure, did we say? The number of times a particle hits off the surface. right? So there are less particles, or there's less impacts going on there than there was initially. And that's why the pressure is less. So Boyle's Law, you might be familiar with it because you've heard about it somewhere along the line. Boyle's Law looks at the relationship between pressure and volume. And, and we do a test and we measure pressure, but you can measure pressure without ever actually knowing what's going on or what you're actually measuring or why that dial that measures the pressure is changing. The reason it's changing is because the number of molecules hitting the surface is going up or coming down. Okay? So as the volume increases, what do you think happens to pressure? Decrease. It decreases. So there's certainly an inverse relationship between them. If it was directly inversely proportional, what would happen? How does directly inversely change from just say they're inversely? Double the volume, the actual half. Yeah, if you double one, the other by halves. If you triple one, the other one goes down by a third. And that's what Boyle said. He said if you multiply one by a factor of three or four, the other one goes down by a factor of three or four. And that's the Leibniz experiment that we'll be doing in a few minutes. But we're just setting you up with some of the theory here. Now that's one dimension. If, however, and we have a problem all the time in physics and saying there's always too many variables when you try to measure something. If I was to heat that up, what would happen? It would go faster. It would go faster. What would happen to pressure? It would increase. It would increase. So I'm looking at Boyle's law says I'm looking at volume and I'm looking at pressure. What do I need to ensure doesn't change? Constant at constant temperature. And that's important. Right? And we see later on why that might be a problem. Right.